at some point in human history, there was someone who had a simple dream, a practical methodology of weapon design that persists to the 41st millennium, that principle being, what if we took a weapon that exists already, but like, made it really, really big. Thus was born the Mega Bolters, essentially Gatling weapons, but really big. And if this is not one of the purest examples of human vision and ingenuity, then I don't know what is. The Mega Bolter also opted for the twinned Gatling choice, and it makes one wonder, imagine if we created a new version of the A-10 Thunderbolt, but this time added two 30mm cannon. This is essentially the kind of thinking that brought humanity to where it is now, in the 41st millennium. Mega Bolters of either the Vulcan or Castigator variants are one of the most potent and effective anti-infantry weapons available to the Imperium. For obvious reasons of thousands of scaled bolt rounds thumping into waves of heretics or xenos, the mass reactive shells leaving carbonized remains and the ground itself scorched, few vehicles can support this platform required to enable a mega bolter and only titans or super heavy vehicles can carry the Vulcan variant. The slightly more reasonable Castigator bolt cannon seen on the Sorestus Castigator Knights, a far more ancient pattern, is essentially a slightly scaled down Vulcan cannon. Both though are truly obscene Gatling cannons and the sound alone of their weapons being spun up coupled with the subsequent screaming carnage and obliteration upon the enemies of humanity is a terrifying sight and sound to behold. In fact, the screaming roar of the Vulcan while firing has earned it the nickname Laughter of the Devil amongst Titan crews. The fire of Vulcan Megabolters have been unleashed across war-torn worlds for thousands of years via the god engines of the Mechanicus and the super-heavy tanks of the Militarum. Wherever they are deployed, they excel in scouring the enemies of humanity from the surface of any world, and their torrent of firepower is capable of cutting clean through even the most savage and gigantic of Xenos, pulping infantry into bloody piles of viscera, cutting through waves of charging alien horrors till the air itself is saturated by clouds of churned up blood and chitin. Just like their ancient ancestors millennia previous, humanity in M41 continues to use one of its most tried and tested methods of destruction through sheer volume of firepower. Such weapons are semi-practical on the move for taking out specific targets or clearing areas in support, but they excel as stationary support weapons fed a continuous feed of ammunition. For those little that can resist a support battery of Stormlords, Macarius Vulcans, Warhound and Reaver Titans, throwing down a continuous wall of mass reactive shells, an unrelenting tsunami of firepower. No matter that it's mounted on a Warhound or Reaver Titan, Stormlord or Macarius tank, the Vulcan Mega Bolter's unrelenting hail of fire will annihilate their formations without mercy, clearing the way for the Imperium's defenders, leaving only their shredded remains behind, if that. Both primary patterns of Mega Bolter are essentially two paired rotary Gatling style cannons, and these rotate at an extremely high speed, laying down withering fire, and as with most Imperial specifications, it's annoyingly difficult to be sure of precise details in regard to these weapons, similarly to say speculations about the height of Imperial Titans, which really should be easy to measure, but for some reason remains speculative. But seriously, can somebody just ask a Mechanicus tech to get out a tape measure? Now, speaking of details, during my research, the only source I could find listing the Vulcan Megabolter's firing rate was in an ancient 4th edition rules for the Apocalypse game, which seemed a very bizarre location for such specific information, not least because I couldn't find it anywhere else. The scarcity in the lore of some details continues to amusingly mirror that of the 40k verse itself, and I like to imagine it's akin to pushing open a dusty door, reams of archive and ledgers have fallen against the door behind and as you push it open your imperial illuminator casting light across ancient parchments and barely functional data slates you somehow find amid the reams of long since irrelevant data that singular detail that was missing or that's my lucid imaginings anyway so what I found was a reference stating quite bluntly that the firing rate for the Vulcan Megabolter is a surprisingly slow 30 rounds a second, thus putting it obviously at a firing rate of 1800 RPM. 
It's worth considering this is comparable to the GAU-12 cannon used in an AC-130 and even an A-10's GAU-8, which was originally variable up to 4200 RPM but now fixed at 3900 RPM. Then you have the M134 minigun capable of firing up to 6000 RPM, which is also now said to have a slower fixed rate of firing at 3000 RPM. Anyway, discuss among yourselves in the comments about these details and associated history. With any kind of weaponry, there exists numerous maintenance issues to be considered, as well as overall lifetime deterioration. For example, the GAU-8 is judged to have a minimum life of at least 20,000 rounds for each set of its barrels, before needing to be replaced. Now, Within the 40k verse, it's very plausible that materials used to create such weapons would sidestep such considerations, or enable weapons to at least operate beyond the range of what we understand in the 21st century. One problem which places significant limitations on such weaponry that cannot be easily stepped around is that of ammunition supply, which we will speak about more shortly. Many of you will undoubtedly be glad that unlike in my previous videos about bolt rounds, there's no overtly specific references to depleted deuterium for use in mega bolters. This is such a weird oddity in the original referencing of bolt round composition and we can only presume it was an error meant to be written as depleted uranium. But I included it previously anyway because that's what it says. Although it seems weird to imagine how somebody could really make that error. Which leads me to personally believe this reference was chosen originally just because it sounded cool and sciencey and not for any real world comparisons. Also a small tangent for any who do not know why depleted uranium is valuable in use for projectile composition, it's mainly because of its density, and its increased density enables it to have a significantly high pressure at the point of impact, making it better for armour penetration. So something like depleted uranium would also sit quite readily within the 40k verse, where irradiated battlefields and other such horrors are the norm. Which, when you think about it, is quite disturbing because yet again, 40k overlaps concerningly easily with our own reality. Regardless, by any comparison, Mega Bolters of the Imperium are perhaps surprisingly not as extreme as one might imagine. Of course, they're still truly ferocious, and as anyone who has heard the fire of a GAU 812 or M134 Gatling cannon, this type of weaponry somehow evokes strong emotions. Likely this is just the realisation of the sheer power being deployed, thereby stoking a very rational sense of awe, coupled with an appreciation that said firepower is not being directed your way, or perhaps it's more of a dark comedic awareness of the sheer human madness that enabled us to end up with such a device. Wherever we see these kind of cannon being implemented, they tend to become near legendary in status. Example, aircraft like the A-10 Thunderbolt and the AC-130, both infamous for their ability to wreak horrifying damage against their targets. So, in the same sense, the deployment of any piece of hardware within the Imperium, sporting a twin Gatling Mega Bolter using titanic scale rounds or otherwise, paired with the explosive power of their mass reactive shells, is going to be something that embiggens the heart of many an Imperial Guardsman and makes the enemies of humanity cower at the sight and sound of such a horrific piece of support weaponry. However, there is one small problem which is, as I've noted before, a problem that is often carefully sidestepped around within the 40k verse, and that problem being ammunition. Now for starters, let's begin with another real-world comparison, the A-10 aircraft. Now typically this carries a loadout of 1150 30mm rounds, but its fire rate is 3900 RPM. So this gives you a sense of how much it can continuously fire before being completely spent, with that being about 17 to 20 seconds. It's not very long, and it's why it's limited to bursts of just a few seconds. Another example is the AC-130's GAU-12, which uses 25mm rounds, but obviously has the potential capacity for significantly more ammunition. These help to give just an impression of how much ammunition is required for a Gatling vehicle mounted weapon to be even minimally operational. 
Now, despite the limitations for aircraft, this is generally fine, because in the case of something like an A-10 or AC-130, they're there to provide fire support, to come in, strike a specific target at a critical juncture in a mission or deployment, not necessarily for continual, sustained engagements, and if that were the case, then a nearby means of resupply would be necessary. Within the verse of 40k, something like a Stormlord, Macarius Vulcan, Castigator Knight or Warhound Titan are not really close support vehicles. The only thing that comes close and uses a twin megabolt cannon configuration is the Space Marine's Fire Raptor gunship, which wields an Avenger bolt cannon, essentially what looks to be a twin version of an A-10's GAU-8, if you can imagine such a thing. For the rest though, they're primarily used as an active, engaging frontline unit on a battlefield, potentially for sustained periods of time. So how reasonable is this given the limitations? Interestingly, only the Castigator Knight is seen to have an actual visible ammo supply to its massive Castigator bolt cannon, whereas the Macarius Vulcan and the Warhound Titans are a little more vague about their capacity and also where the large amounts of ammunition required to make their weapons even plausible are stored. However, in both situations, it is at least somewhat addressed. In the case of the Macarius Vulcan, it is actually explained that it only carries enough ammunition for 20 seconds of continuous firing, and it allows us to understand that it means if we take this supposed speed of a Vulcan Megabolter at 30 rounds per second, it's therefore only going to be carrying a loadout of something like 600 rounds per cannon, roughly 1200 total, which is to be honest quite reasonable. Plus, for this reason, it's even noted that the crew of a Mac Vulcan will fill every possible space for ammunition and even bring additional crates or belts presumably. It's also explained how sometimes they even carry external support for additional resupply, although this obviously can create problems of its own. Dragging around tons of ammo is not ideal when enemies are actively engaging you with the kind of weapons seen in the 41st millennium. However, for something like a Mac Vulcan, it may be seen as more of a support weapon to help defend key positions. However, for something like a Mac Vulcan, it may also additionally be used in the role of a support weapon to help defend key positions. Now, critically, support weapon in this sense is not the same as close support. You're not necessarily moving into a battle space to engage. It's more like defending a line position. So essentially an area denial tool for laying down massive amounts of suppressing firepower at incoming enemy. But it just also happens to be mounted on a mobile vehicle. So it's more likely it's going to be used as a means to support ground forces in this way and defend bunker positions where it can be readily supplied with ammunition, enabling it to fire for extended engagements. The Macarius is said to primarily focus on clearing trench lines and suppressing enemy for its weapon, while saturating in rounds, lacks the punch of heavy weaponry needed in M41 to break heavily armoured units or bunker positions. Now, in the case of the Stormlord, it's simply described as something akin to a mobile fortress. It's believed they're able to carry anything up to 4,000 rounds, so considerably more ammunition than a Mac Vulcan. Although saying that, it's designed to have substantial transport capacity, being one of the largest transporters of infantry available for the Militarum, and so it may not be primarily focused on maximising firepower. Thus, the tank itself is described as taking an infantry support role and has been deployed to great effect against horrors such as the Tyranids, with guardsmen giving the vehicle the nickname of being safe houses. The combination of its impressive defensive capability and significant armament makes it a formidable fighting machine of the Imperium. Now, that's all fine for these Vulcan Megabolter tanks, but what about the Castigator Knight? Well, the Castigator clearly carries a significant reserve of ammunition. This is visible on it. Likely, this is still only enough for bursts of firepower, but at least it's clearly visible. An estimation would be that it's carrying potentially something around a thousand rounds. It's again, at least a plausible quantity of ammunition and enough for me to at least suspend my disbelief and say, okay, they made a solid effort to demonstrate its theoretical functionality. And the same can really be said for the Fire Raptor gunship. Whilst its ammunition is not visible necessarily, it is plausible that it would be able to maintain that capability. But when it comes to Warhound Titans, this is where I think things become somewhat more difficult. Titan Megabolters appear to have what is essentially a box mag attached below each cannon on the weapon itself. These are used, presumably, to feed what is a very hungry twin cannon, and using my half-arse calculations, 
it looks to me like each of the two box mags for the Warhound Titans can possibly only carry about 50 to 60 rounds, perhaps 100 rounds if we were being generous. And this is judging by the scale of the barrel itself to estimate the size of the rounds. So if we are giving each box generously 100 rounds, that's going to give you about two and a half to three seconds of firepower. So you best not miss. Now, there's no specific scale for the rounds used in the Vulcan Mega Bolter of a Warhound, and so I was left to just judge by the scale of the barrels on the Titans themselves. There is reference in the lore to a Vulcan Mega Bolter on a Titan scale using rounds the size of a human skull, whatever the hell that means, but based on the idea that potentially the rounds could be slightly different size, I did also do two other overlays to try and see if adjusting scale helps. Now in this image, the magazine ends up allowing for about 240 rounds, so significantly more than the larger rounds in my first example, but still the capacity is woefully inadequate. And then I used a Titanicus scale Warhound image to overlay, now interestingly and likely because on this scale the barrels are smaller, I thought well what if on the larger miniatures the barrels were just too large or again it's just not quite accurately representing. Well unfortunately even when accounting for this, even when I'm making the rounds potentially smaller, you still only end up with about 360 rounds per box magazine for the Vulcan Mega Bolter of a Warhound Titan. Now I suppose we could be very generous in both cases and add say an extra 100 rounds on top. But again, this is still only going to enable the weapon to fire for something like 12 to 13 seconds, which I think given the impression of how they're supposed to operate is hardly world ending, although I suppose that depends if you're actively being targeted by it. But in honesty, this whole ammunition thing is a wider problem than just for mega bolters, because 40k in general suffers from a willfully ignored problem when it comes to the issue of ammunition supply, when it comes to the issue of ammunition supply. For example, have you, like me, often wondered how is it that Terminators rearm themselves whilst in the depths of a Space Hulk? What about Dreadnoughts deep into a battlefield and not forgetting of course Space Marines who seem to carry weapons whose capacity is probably about 10 rounds max, yet rarely do they seem to carry ammo and if so it's just one pouch. Where's the Servitor Battle Ammo Resupply Drones? Well, thankfully it's a good job they all have those very small knives or perhaps a chainsaw because pretty much after their first engagement, they're going to be out of ammo. Now, considering how deep 40k lore goes in other areas, insofar that it takes huge efforts via both the miniatures and overall narrative to expand on really specific details, yet basic functionality rarely appears to be one of those things. And this is in fact one of those things that considerably irks me, as I personally significantly enjoy conceptualizing the real world workings of these things, you can probably guess that. And this is including things like logistics and any concerns related around this. So in the midst of a battle of 40k, where does each part of the logistical chain fit in? Why were things decided ahead of time and so forth? Where are the resupplies coming in? Are they doing ammo based airdrops? This sort of thing. I think this is why sometimes battle drama in 40k novels can fall a little flat for me, as it often tends to be just pitched battles or individual duels. When there are extended campaigns, the focus again generally becomes about battles, individuals, but less fleshing out of these subsidiary details, which are quite honestly just as interesting. And why? Well, because real world history shows us how often, so often, wars are won and lost by forces overstretching the limits of their resupply lines, and it's often a very specific target of opposing forces to destroy resupply lines to starve their enemy of ammunition and other essential supplies. And this rarely is any sort of concern in 40k. It tends to be maximum obliteration is the only way, which I guess is fitting, but not necessarily always the most plausible. Then again, you might be tempted to say, Luton, this is the 40k verse, who the hell cares about plausibility? And I'd say fair enough, but still for me personally, I will say something that I've said before, which is that within a verse like 40k, while it is entirely true that it is filled with a galaxy of crazy aliens, weapons that could turn you inside out and so forth, why is something so simple as a weapon having enough ammo so critical, why is this the hill to die on? Sure, I know for some people this might seem a very small and minimal thing to get hung up on in the grand scheme of things, but as I've explained previously, there have to be parameters to the suspension of disbelief in order for any verse to be reasonably entertaining at all. Think of it like this, 
when something exists outside of our sphere of understanding, then we can dismiss its parameters more easily, like say demons or psychers or the warp. These things are easier for us to suspend disbelief because the actual functionality is so disconnected from our everyday reasoning. Now also, for as crazy as the 40k verse is, many details are surprisingly logical and reasonable. No, really. So let's take, for example, the Tyranids. For as horrifying as the Tyranids are, they're an alien species who have evolved to this state of nightmare bioweaponry and we can make sense of that in our mind. We understand this sort of evolutionary concept. The Tau, they have very advanced tech. Unlike the Imperium, they're not limited in expansion of technology. So you can believe their technological growth and so forth. You can go down the list of other species in the 40k galaxy. For as insane as much of the stuff in 40k is, it's believable enough that you can suspend disbelief. And I think sometimes that's what makes it so compelling and scary. It is completely insane very often, it is completely over the top very often, but it just retains enough plausibility to keep you engaged. There are other races like the Eldar and the Necron, and these are more problematic, but that's not something to get into today. So for me personally, what is far more difficult to suspend disbelief over are things that we do actually have logical understandings of, but that are subsequently rendered practically impossible by just poor explanations. So things like having a weapon that requires definitely thousands of rounds of ammunition to make it even minimally functionally effective, and then equipping it with a magazine that would only enable it to fire for two seconds, if that. So suspension of disbelief only goes so far. There has to be real world anchors and limitations in any fictional verse, because if the answer to any detail, which has no easy answer, is just, well, everything else is crazy, so it doesn't matter. If that's somebody's position, not only does it sound disingenuous and dismissive, because it probably is, but it also means it's probably never worth having any further discussions about anything from there on, because essentially anything goes. When it comes to hardware using Imperial Mega Bolters, for me personally, the Mac Vulcan, the Castigator, they both get a pass for me. They make an effort to rationalise the fact their weapons require a ton of ammunition in order to be feasible. Both I can see being somewhat practical for different purposes on a 40k battlefield and adaptive at that. Then you also have the Fire Raptor gunship with its Avenger Bolt Cannon. This also gets a pass, it has enough internal space, they could fit something similar to what an A-10 carries, so that's also plausible for me. In the sphere of Titans, the Warlord and Reaver, now again, I could rationalise both of their Mega Bolters using their decent internal storage space for ammunition, but it's the Warhound that's the real sticking point for me. Apparently, the way Warhound Titan Vulcan Mega Bolters work is that while a Titan is in combat, one crew member is also using a magnetic crane in the weapon arm itself to feed chains or I guess belts of ammunition in a constant flow to the weapon. These are loaded from massive grav hoppers, presumably before the battle, and these ammo boxes, chains, are said to contain enough shells to last over a number of days in the most severe battles. Meanwhile, a second crew member is continually evoking the litany of reloading and redemption sanctioned by the Adeptus Mechanicus, to ensure the smooth release of ammunition and that the plentiful supply of mass reactive shells continues to load properly. All the while pouring blessed oils into the whirring mechanisms whenever the Vulcan Megabolter is in danger of overheating. Not entirely sure that that would be enough to stop something like that overheating, but at this point, never mind. Now, for all the mental gymnastics around this, it's something that I can tolerate. I think a reasonable rationalisation for me would be to say, well, if only the rounds themselves were significantly more damaging. But unfortunately, in actuality, the rounds are surprisingly weak. They're not designed really for armour penetration, but for suppression and area denial to mass waves of enemy infantry. Which again, it really only makes things worse, because likely just as you would open fire, it would all be over. So the two things don't pair, they don't really sit together. Like I said, if you're going to shoot with this weapon, you better be damn sure to hit your target, because you only get one chance. Is this the most implausible thing in 40k? Definitely not. Is it something I can live with, albeit with a burning irritation in the back of my mind? Yes. Does it make me want to remodel all of my Titanicus Warhound Mega Bolters with double the size ammo boxes? Also yes.
Vulcan Mega Bolters, Castigator Bolt Cannons, Avenger Bolt Cannons evoke a terrifying display of firepower that originates deep in humanity's long history of warfare. Not entirely dissimilarly to those ancient darkest of times, the Imperium of the 41st Millennium relies on horrifying wars of attrition to survive in the galaxy of the dark future, thus making Mega Bolt weapons absolutely suited to the environments they're deployed in a screaming, raging torrent of ammunition that decimates any who wander into the field of fire. While such tools have their impracticalities, humanity remains nothing if not ingenious enough to ensure that the maximum levels of decimation can be maintained. Within the Fire Raptor, for example, much like the A-10 of the 20th century, it is configured to maximize ammo storage, sacrificing any transport capacity to enable its devastating suite of weaponry. Most fearsome, of course, being its twin Avenger bolt cannons. Similarly, the Castigator Knight and Mach Vulcan enable the maximum ammo capacity available for their vehicle to maintain devastation. And then lastly, the Vulcan Mega Bolters on Titans. While ammunition is an issue, the most effective use for such a weapon is as a fortification defense or to hold a line against the enemy, or in the case of Titans breaking void shields. Many Xenos encountered by humanity assault in waves numbering hundreds of thousands of units, and this is where you would want to see entire sections of Mach Vulcan tanks or Titans sitting behind fortifications, Storm Lords being continually fed ammunition from stationary positions, Servitors and Mechanicus teams ensuring that the weapons are kept in optimal firing condition to unleash a devastating and relentless torrent of fire upon the enemy, so much so that the sheer level of pressure and kinetic energy will bury any who are not completely disintegrated by the power of the hailstorm raining down upon them. It was thanks to the tech priests of Forge World Lucius that the Imperium has the capability to field such defences, with they having been the first to explore the options of mounting the Vulcan Megabolter onto these tank variants. Remembering that this sits within the tolerated adaptions of the Adeptus Mechanicus, adjacent adaptation is not considered tech heresy, at least by most, and for those long experienced in the arcane construction of god machines, the tech priest began attempting to transfer the weapon across to other vehicles in the period of late M33. Unfortunately, Imperial records state that many of the machine spirits reacted badly to their initial efforts, and these failed rituals led to the destruction of many tanks before relatively stable patterns were developed. And personally, I always love these descriptions of the Mechanicus and their machine spirits. For any who are unaware, machine spirits are generally speaking simplistic AI that are unable to alter or upgrade themselves, and so the Mechanicus see them as not dangerous. The reference to them as machine spirits is primarily due to the technology that enables them being so advanced and incomprehensible, it's seen more as spiritual than technology itself. It's effectively the equivalent of somebody from the Bronze Age trying to understand Siri. So suffice to say, likely, the tech priests just couldn't get the weaponry to sync with the tanks and ended up frying many vehicles before they finally figured it out. So thus, eventually, they were able to appease the mighty machine spirits with no doubt heavy quantities of incense and sacred oils, and by finally appeasing the machine spirit into accepting the modifications, blessed is the Omnissiah, they were successful. For many simple individuals in the Imperium of Mankind, the sight of any machine of war is much more than they can comprehend, but most especially the titans that stride across the battlefields. In fact, for many facing down a titan, this is where the description of titan shock occurs. To witness such things for many is to truly believe in the god spirit spoken of by the devout followers of the machine cult and may well turn many into true believers, especially if they're accompanied by Skitari on a battlefield. For many, of course, the weaponry of the Imperium is all but holy, and to witness it in action is a miracle and a blessing. To see Mega Bolter weapons is to understand the imagination and ingenuity of humanity, but also to marvel at its horror. For those like the Sororitas, who see divine significance in nearly all things, we may wonder what they make of such weapons. We can quite easily read into the metaphorical significance of weaponry like the Vulcan Mega Bolter, an unstoppable, irresistible force pulping and disintegrating the enemies of the Emperor until all that remains is a cloud of blood from the otherwise vaporized foes and a carbonized, pockmarked battlefield. For we all walk with the will of the Omnissiah. Where he sends us we will go, it is ours to trust and to obey. Mm -hmm.